Greetings, everyone. My name is James Prysock. I'm the director of the Office of Social Justice and Activism here at Otterbein University, and today I'm joined by... I'm TJ Kirkins. I'm the chair of the Department of Theater and Dance. I'm a lighting designer, and I'm a proud Otterbein alumnus. And the purpose of our conversation today is to really give an update about the things that have been going on in the theater program. I know there have been concerns that have been brought up uh, from alumni and other stakeholders about the racial diversity within the department. And especially looking at the incoming class this year, could you talk to us about what happened? Sure, but first I want to just thank James. I want to just acknowledge James as a partner in this process. And frankly, he's been a true partner in this entire endeavor. So I'm honored to have you. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so looking at this year, you asked me about the mm -hmm. year. I'm gonna to expand to, to about 15 months. It's gonna be maybe a metric year, we'll call it. And in looking at the past 15 months, uh, about 15 months ago, we were engaged by a group of our black alumni, and they came to the department and they said, we'd like you to have a listening session with us. They provided a Zoom link, and we spent about two and a half hours, if I recall, mm -hmm. on a Zoom call with the group, and they shared with us a lot of things about their experience and their time at Otterbein. They shared some beautiful, generous things. Uh, they, they shared their love of Otterbein. They shared what they got out of Otterbein. They also shared a lot of painful experiences, um, experiences that they had as black students in a predominantly white institution, steeped in a predominantly white culture. They held us accountable for that culture and suggested changes we could make, and we listened to them. In the ensuing couple months, we had a lot of very challenging discussions, a lot of self-examination, um, and we produced a document, a document on uh, racial equity and inclusion and healing. We also produced a time, a timeline, which kind of outlined what we planned to do and when we hoped to do it. We released it over Facebook and social media and, out, and rolled it out to our students. And then you fast forward to the spring. This spring, we rolled out our, our fall freshman class, the folks coming in this fall to be our new class of students. And when you glanced over them at first glance, you might draw a conclusion that all of our class is white. The whole class is white. Looking at that and listening to what we had said and what we had published, and the lack of any intervening uh, conversation or communication, you might also conclude or draw a conclusion that at first glance, departments do nothing. Departments all talk, no action. And so we'd like to address that today. And I hope by the end of the conversation, you'll understand what our situation is, and you'll understand that we've actually done quite a deal, great deal in the last year. Could you talk to us about uh, part of the process is the offers that you put out, and so uh, what did that ratio look like? Okay, so when we look at our incoming class, uh, first of all, a couple of things to consider. One is the environment. Looking at the environment, we were recruiting during a pandemic. We were all virtual. We were recruiting for a field that is based on personal interconnection. Also, if you are an alum or you are a current student, you know that connecting with Lenny Leibowitz is perhaps one of the most impactful experiences you can have. So doing it all virtually was difficult. We were also doing it amidst a time when each of us was wrestling with how to teach online, how to produce online, how to produce for video, how to record vocals individually offline and combine them with live action to create a streaming product. It was a very, very difficult time and we were recruiting in a new environment. We had hoped that the new environment would bring us a much broader range of students. Virtual auditions, after all, have much fewer barriers to access. So we were hoping for a much larger, more diverse group. The group was a little smaller, and one of the things we found was that they were also applying to a greater range of schools. So we had, in past, we'd have a student, they say, yeah, I'm applying to Otterbein, I'm applying to eight other schools. This year they're saying to us, hey, I'd like to come to Otterbein or one of these 50 other schools. So we found that in an environment where students were applying to many other schools, and in the midst of a long overdue, frankly, social revolution where we're trying to correct centuries old wrongs that still persist, we have a situation where our students of diversity, our, our, our prospective students of diversity, are in great demand by any institution that's looking and seeking justice. So we have the same pool of students being spread a little bit thin and then being competed for in a way that frankly we've never had them compete before. So we look at you know, what kind of offers we can make and what kind of things we can control and what we can't control. We can control the offers we make. We can influence how a person feels about coming. We can't really control whether they choose to enroll or not. 
So one of the th questions is, what does our diversity look like, and how did it look, and where are we? And what I've lift up is that this year has been an anomaly. We are down in our diversity numbers this year for the first time in about four years. In the four years prior to the pandemic, each year we had a more diverse class, starting at about 17% four years before and topping out at about 28% the year before. And in the two years prior to the pandemic, we actually exceeded the diversity of the university as a whole. And the university, if you don't know it, has been making giant strides towards having a more diverse representative class. So in the two years prior, we were making great strides and outpacing the university in our, in our diversity levels. Then came this year, the pandemic, the anomaly year, and frankly, we're at 15% right now. Of our enrolled students, we are at 15%, which is a setback. It is not the result we had hoped for. It's not the result we worked very hard to get, and uh, frankly, was a disappointment for us. So I think that a, a point to make is that we had been proceeding on a great trajectory. We've had a setback. We need to assess where we are, how we move forward, how we get back on track, and how we reach a class that is representative more of the Central Ohio area and hopefully our nation as a whole. I know one of the things that people are very curious about is what did the offers look like for this incoming class? So we know the results yeah. of that, but what did the initial offers look like? That's a great question. Um, and actually one that was posed by one of our alumni who called me uh, this summer asking me directly that question. We talked about control and what we can't control. We can't control offers. So what did they look like uh, this past recruiting cycle? Um, the overall, if you compare the total number of applicants, you know, the 500 and some odd applicants, uh, about 19% of them self-identified as people of color. Okay. Then when you look at how many offers we made, when you look at the total of offers we made, 21% of our offers went out to people of color, who people who identified as being of color. So the numbers were proportionate. We would love them to be better. Honestly, in the past they've been better. We're going to get better. But this year they were proportional to the number of people of color as part of the pool, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. One thing I'd also like to lift up is uh, as feedback came in this summer from our alumni about the incoming class, it, it's easy to, to feel negative about it, which to be honest, I did. But it's also in a way something I really value in our alumni. I appreciate the way our alumni came to us, the way our alumni shared both items of joy and generosity, while also really holding us accountable for the culture and demanding change. And this is something that I appreciate. Everybody could have sat back on their couch and let it go. They could have not engaged us in a constructive manner. And in a way, I feel honored by the work assigned and the ability to work with people to help make significant changes that can, I hope, help erase centuries of problems that still persist. That made it a little bit harder for me when I dropped the ball in the spring and did not share with you. So if I wonder why at first glance did people assume perhaps that we had done nothing, I would have probably made that same conclusion. And our job here today is to share with you what we've done and where we're going. Yes, and the alumni that uh, reached out and expressed their concerns did were very generous in doing so because they also congratulated everyone who was yeah. accepted into the yes. program and so though you don't didn't have the outcome that you would hope for how are your feelings about the incoming class overall i'm so glad you mentioned that because that was something i noticed immediately in the posts that so many people started their post with welcome congratulations you're in a great place and frankly our freshmen deserve that and i'm so glad that our our alumni share that and express that to our freshmen. Frankly, I'm of two minds. I'm disappointed that our class does not look like we wanted it to in the level of diversity. And at the same time, I'm thrilled, excited, and proud of every student who's here. Every student who's here has earned that place. Every student who's here is worthy of that place. Every student who's here, I'm looking forward to spending the next four years with. And in terms of that, mix of disappointment slash excitement, I'm going to use an analogy from improv. So those of you who are taking any of our classes right now or took them, uh, listen up. And that is the yes and. Am I disappointed that our class isn't more diverse? Yes. 
and I'm really thankful and excited for every single person who's here with us. Absolutely. Am I excited about all the people with us? Yes. And I wish we had a broader base of diversity in the class. One does not exclude the other. So I'm excited and disappointed. Yes, and. Thank you for that, TJ. Sure. So before we go into what does the recruitment strategy look like for next year, I uh, wanted to kind of talk about that recruitment is just one piece of the pie, right? That's one piece of how people uh, would like to see the department move forward. And, uh, and, and so I, I say that uh, I've been really pleased to be involved and I appreciate you inviting me uh, to do inclusive leadership uh, sessions with the faculty and staff of the department. It's, I think it's very important that if we're going to invite students into this space, that the leaders of the classroom, the leaders of the department have you know, a holistic sense of how can we make sure that every student that matriculates through our walls are gonna feel valued, heard, and understood. And so we did some leadership sessions with the faculty and staff, and I know I've also done some one-on-ones with students uh, to get that qualitative data and those narratives and some of their ideas. And I think they brought up a lot of great suggestions. Uh, so can you talk to us about what else is the department doing to move forward? Yeah, a, a big focus of this past year for us has frankly been building culture and building a culture of inclusivity. If we think about recruiting, mm -hmm. uh, before you can really actively recruit people effectively, you have to create an environment where that student is going to feel welcome, that mm -hmm. student is going to feel heard, seen, represented, they're going to feel like it's a place that they fit in. So one of the places we want to start was building a culture of inclusivity, and of course that is perhaps some of the most difficult work and the most um, pervasive work that needs to be done. So we were, we we're gonna be focusing on how we can uh, build this inclusive environment right. and this culture, how we can self-examine ourselves and our curriculum to make sure that we're providing this inclusive environment, how we can amplify diverse voices, both in our classroom and on our stage, how we can uh, improve our hiring practices so we can diversify our faculty and staff, and how we can improve the student experience at Otterbein mm -hmm. so that we come up, become a place where students of any color or any aspect or dimension of diversity will feel welcome and feel at home and feel included. So this, this past year, we started out with self-examination and training. Mm -hmm. uh, James, as you mentioned, you, you brought your inclusive leadership training to us. We uh, spent hours with you. You basically went through many things and also asked us what we needed to know. Mm -hmm. One of the things about a lot of the ideas in our document is they are large ideas and how do we apply them to the granular nature of theatrical training and production. And so our, our faculty asked you questions back. Yes. What does colored consciousness really mean in the casting room? Can a white director work on material that speaks to black audiences in a way that's authentic and real. Uh, lots of questions like that are really pertinent to how do we live this. We've stated we want to do it, how do we live it? And one of the things that you, James, did that I thought was really beautiful was took that back to our students with a survey. Can you talk a little bit about that survey and where we went with it? Yes, yeah, so the one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, we're very informing. I think it helps us to be very intentional about how we move forward at, in, in leading the department. And so a couple of things came out of that along the topics of not only recruitment, but uh, hiring practices. Uh, they talked about just student experience uh, things, having a voice and uh, to be able to be at the tables where decisions are being made uh, and that they could be consulted to where they're not necessarily representative of their identity, but their, their values are being brought to the table and their perspectives are also there uh, before the department moves forward with different decisions that are being made. Uh, and then another piece of that was looking at how can they be an integral piece of moving the department forward uh, and, and just looking at that their experiences are going to be something that is going to lead into their experiences after Otterbein. And, and how our job is to prepare students for that next level. And so they were looking at the experiences that they're able to get here uh, are gonna help them be more inclusive leaders also. 
Uh, and so I guess we'll focus maybe more on the, the hiring side first, if that's okay with sure. you. And so what has Otterbein done, the Department of Theater done, to look at the hiring of um, more diverse faculty and staff within the department? Sure. This is one of the things that our, fa our alums brought to us as a priority. We are a predominantly white faculty within the, and staff within the department. And so how do we look at this and how do we change it? And my initial response, frankly, was I don't think we can because given the economy, we're probably not going to be making a lot of hires. But we had some people choose, as many did during the pandemic, to change what they're doing. And we were uh, in a position of having three positions that were empty. And although the university, like most universities, has been in a situation where hiring is constricted due to the pandemic, they approved our positions. They saw them as valuable and integral to recruitment, to maintaining our program, and they advance these. So suddenly we had the opportunity to make these hires. So how do we go about doing it? The university's HR department had put into place a whole bunch of anti-bias trainings and activities that we jumped into. All uh, committee members had to be receiving uh, anti-bias training. We had a set of questions we developed that went to every individual. Before we could start interviews, we had to come up with a list of places that we were going to post intentionally to try to diversify the pool of applicants. And before we could even post, we had to have this list of where we were going to be going and why. And the HR department reported back to us that actually theater had presented the largest, most thorough list of new places to post. Um, and so we, we basically took on this from a new lens in a way. One of the things we found in the hiring process, however, is that a lot of these same policies made it hard for us to be color conscious or to be trying to work from a position of being proactive on diversity because it was all built around anti-bias and kind of not knowing who our folks of color are and what they bring and that the emphasis was mainly on education and on job qualifications in the resume. Mm -hmm. So we went back to you, James. I, I remember discussing this with you and with Scott Fitzgerald from HR who partnered with us. And together we came up with an idea of, let's, let's put a diversity question as a requirement on every application. And then we'll create a criteria in the hiring process, which is what is this individual's contribution to equity and inclusion within our department? That became a criteria that was weighed right along with where you went to school, what your degree was, what your body of experience is. And it allows us to value that and credit that in a real and concrete way. And you might ask, does this mean that a white person can't score high on this? And the answer is no, because we have people, who applicants who came to us and their answers to this question revealed that they had substantial diversity training, had acted as change agents in their previous organizations to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in their prior organizations. That person scores really highly in this category and that gets weighed in. And once again, it allows us to apply concrete value to the diversity and equity and inclusion component a candidate brings into our department and our university. The other thing the diversity question does, it also helps us know the person a little bit, helps us make sure that people that we are hiring are in their hearts good, generous people who are working for justice, which is a value that we hold within the department and the university. So we then basically took this criteria and began to apply it to our hiring process. And we made three hires between May and August and one hire was a white male who scored very high on his previous social justice and diversity training, having a history of activism on the diversity front, and the fact that one of the reasons he wanted this job was the ability to make substantive change to improve our department. We also hired a black woman who has come in. She has amazing administrative I experience at larger schools like Boston University. She also has a theater degree and experience with high school students who are making that transition to college. We also brought in a third candidate, a white woman who is in our costume department, and she comes in with a strong background of social activism and commitment to diversifying the costume area of the theater world. So we were able to apply this and come up with three successful hires, each of which is going to improve our department's efforts towards equity and inclusion. That's awesome, TJ. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, another 
thing that common theme that was brought up was about show selection mm. Uh, mm. And, and having more representation yeah. that allows us to do more things to get more of those values out there to our community from the stage. Uh, so can you talk to us about uh, what has the department done to move forward on that front? Yeah, that's one of the big, if you think about uh, culture and buckets, mm -hmm. one of the big buckets for us is amplifying diverse voices, mm -hmm. which includes representation, includes who's speaking, who's playing the parts, and how we produce and what we bring into our classroom. And one of the things we did in this culture building year is look for ways to do that. And we've taken a number of concrete steps. One is in self-examination, we realize that we all know the plays we know. So as we look for new seasons, we choose from the plays we know. It's a very limited pool. It's constrained by culture. It's constrained our personal experiences. So we've created a set of play reading groups. Play reading groups are targeted around black authors, Latinx authors, Asian authors, female authors, one targeting new plays, one targeting uh, new contemporary musicals. And the idea is to surface work that is new to us and will serve these different areas and bring more voices to our stage. Mm -hmm. Two of the plays in our current upcoming season generated from these groups. Uh, we'll be doing a play called The Polaroid Stories by Naomi Azuka. Naomi's an American of Japanese and Latinx descent. And we're also going to be doing The Heidi Chronicles, which is by a Jewish female author. Both of those surfaced in the play reading groups in the fall. And this is the way we hope to work forward with that. We're also working with our resident playwright at Otterbein, Jeremy Lawrence, who is a, a black man, to commission a new work. And we have funding that we have accrued in an endowment, and we're going to use it to commission a new play, mm -hmm. which Jeremy had written for our students, that we hope to premiere as a workshop in next year, 22-23, and then we hope to bring to our main stage then in 23-24 allowing our students to do work by a black American living playwright who will be working with us in the process. A third prong is being cognizant of our faculty and the predominant whiteness of our faculty. Yeah. We have dedicated a slot in the season for a guest director. Uh, this is not something that's been available to us within the last few years and we're gonna dedicate one slot in the season that we will be looking for a guest director that is representative of a voice that we don't have on our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. And so we will be bringing that in. We've also examined our curriculum, looking for what plays we're teaching, what figures we're teaching about, um, why do a play by um, Connor McPherson in Fundamentals when you can do a play by Susan Laurie Parks. Mm -hmm. Let's bring in those voices. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at our whole curriculum we're hoping to bring plays to the stage from different voices. Excellent. There's a new adjunct uh, yeah. director in the department too, right? Yes, thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, she brings a smile to my face. Um, one In the hiring, we, we had an opportunity for a number of adjuncts this year uh, as we have people on sabbatical and are, are shuffling things. And uh, I consulted the BIPOC director's database on the internet. If you don't know about it, you can Google it. And I thought to myself, there will be nobody in Columbus, Ohio, closed frame, looked in there, opened frame, and lo and behold, we, ha we found a, a wonderful uh, doctoral student just graduated from OSU. She has a background in black theater history. She has a background in directing. She has a background in teaching from an anti-racist uh, pedagogy and philosophy. And she's also an intimacy coach. Mm -hmm. And so she'll be teaching directing with us in both semesters this year. And frankly, I hope to uh, have her teach as much as I can get her for. So that was a, a success in broadening. And frankly, going away from the mindset of this person doesn't exist in Columbus and looking to see if that person does exist in Columbus Absolutely. and bringing them in. We talked about student advocacy and student voices because that's what all the students had in common and their qualitative responses uh, to us. And, and so give us a frame of, there was an idea brought up about a, maybe a, a student organization yeah. that could be within the department. Can you talk to us about the concept of that? Sure, sure. One of the themes in the session with our uh, black student alumni was a feeling of being isolated. Uh, this also showed up in the survey you did when one of the yes. questions was, what should we know about how students of color feel and experience in the department? Mm -hmm. And one of them is isolation, one of them is lack of voice. Um, and so how do we rectify that? And one of the ideas that I believe you may have brought to us, I'm not, I get a little 
caught up in who said what when first, but it was the idea of creating an affinity group, uh, a, a forum where not only could people have a, a forum to speak with each other and share ideas, but they also could act with agency and a degree of anonymity, is that the word? Uh, anonymously, mm -hmm. how about that? Anonymously, without fear of any kind of rep reprisal or uh, power imbalance, to share concerns with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and also could frankly act as a sounding board, uh, getting, providing feedback on policy, checking our policy. When we have these questions, like as a white person, is it appropriate for me to do this in a rehearsal room? These may be students that we could say, hey, we're fielding this to you as a group. What are your individual opinions on this? Mm -hmm. Once again, not asking them to speak for an entire demographic, but how do you, the students who will be impacted by this, feel about this and bring it back to us? So you volunteered to help us with that process. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about where we are with it right now? Yes, so one of the big things we wanted to do is be able to capture uh, voices of students as they matriculate throughout Urbana University. And so the one-on-ones that we did were last year. And so we have new students, but well, we haven't heard from them yet. Yeah. And it's important that their voices are, are valued in this process as well, and that we keep that going as long as we can. And so with that being said, uh, we're going to create uh, a survey that's gonna go out to students that people can have anonymity uh, in their responses, uh, but that gives us some really good feedback so we can be very purposeful about how we move forward. In addition to that, there are other stakeholders out there that would love to be able to keep up to date with things, that would be able to give their own opinions and ideas, uh, and if they want to dedicate any of their time or talent to this cause as we look to move the department forward, they can definitely do that. Uh, and so be on the lookout for, for that, and you know we would appreciate any responses and any thoughtfulness uh, that can help provide further direction uh, as we're trying to navigate these waters. Uh, so we've covered a little bit of recruiting, a yeah. little bit of, of hiring, mm -hmm student advocacy, mm -hmm. um, community engagement. Mm -hmm. I think the natural question is, when we're talking about uh, the recruitment piece in particular, is what are we going to do different this time uh, to get different results? And, and it's, it's great for people to know about a plan that could be put in place to accomplish these things. We don't want to just throw stuff at the wall and just hope it happens, right? right? And we need to be very intentional. Uh, could you talk to us about how the department is looking to try out some new things uh, to have to increase the, the racial diversity of the department? Yeah. I think uh, one of the key things, frankly, is broadening the pool of people who have access, information, and introduction to Otterbein removing the barriers then that prevent them from you know, applying even to Otterbein and attending Otterbein, and then figuring out how to then with the culture, et cetera, make them feel like this is a place they want to be, okay? So the first step, frankly, is finding out where can we go? Where can we introduce ourselves to? Uh, what students don't know about us? Where are places that are places with high diversity, high racial diversity, high diversity in other areas that we're currently not reaching. You know, the majority of professional training programs recruit through New York, LA, Chicago. We also go to the CAP auditions at Atlanta, to Y Pass in Kentucky. We're also present in uh, International Thespians and Kentucky and uh, Texas, Texas. Where aren't we looking? Mm -hmm. You know, where aren't we looking within maybe a three hour radius of Columbus that we could go and make a personal connection. Perhaps we could bring um, a workshop to them, yeah. introduce them to us. Uh, John Stefano, uh, who spent decades here building this program, you know, had a philosophy that part of recruitment, an essential key of recruitment, is to give the person something they didn't have when they walked into the audition room. It's as much about giving as it is receiving. So maybe that is an aspect that we can bring out. I know that in my personal journey, the reason I came to Otterbein is because Fred Pop Thayer came to Hilliard High School in 1982, I'm dating myself, and spoke to our class about why Otterbein was right. So we're, we're trying to isolate or identify what are these places that we can go, how do we get the word out, what are the markets that we go to, okay? So that's one aspect. Another aspect is to continue to break down barriers. Uh, we have, you know, during the pandemic, things went virtual. And virtual removes a lot of barriers. So we're gonna continue with the idea of having virtual auditions alongside equally weighted to 
are in-person auditions. If a person wants to audition for us virtually, it is not less than. Mm -hmm. It is not, okay, this is different. We will embrace that. We will take, carry them with equal weight. We are looking at how, how much does it cost to apply to us? What is the fee to use Accepted? Mm -hmm. We already have a waiver process with um, Accepted that if you, would, if you have the challenges, you can always choose to not uh, pay a, a fee. And we're looking to expand that, make that easier, find out what those barriers are and remove mm -hmm. them. Next step also is then, we have a student we've isolated, identified that we want to bring with into us. We think they're a great fit. How do we make it possible for them? Um, frankly, the, the university provides theater majors with larger packages of financial aid and scholarship than virtually any other major on college, in our college. And I deeply appreciate that, and so do our students. Uh, in the current uh, environment, however, especially students of color are in such high demand that we're competing with larger institutions who are, are putting out very large packages. How do we make it so that we are competitive? How do we make it so they want to come here? So we've been working with our friends at enrollment, our friends at financial aid, and finding ways to find meaningful, targeted money for people of need, people of diversity, that we can use to help when we think they need a game changer. One of the things we've done within the department is we've identified two endowments that we can target for people of color who basically need that support to be able to make the choice to come to Otterbein. We're looking for more of that. We're looking to establish more scholarships. We're looking to establish more funds, but we're trying to find out what is a meaningful amount of money where can it come from? How do we deliver it where it needs to go to be a game changer, to help somebody decide to come? And then again, circling back to culture, how do we tell our story better mm -hmm. so that people can see what we're doing and what we're producing, the proofs in the pudding? How do we carry ourselves in a way that people will want to come see us, come spend four years with us? That's wonderful to hear. I think it's really important when we're talking about achieving results that we haven't achieved before, that means we have to do things that we've never done before. We have to uh, navigate spaces that we haven't navigated before. Uh, to order to do it the, you know, the, a way that's gonna give us some really great results, that's gonna have, uh, bring in folks that are looking at, hey, these barriers have been removed from me, I can focus on my education, I see myself at Otterbein University. So I'm really happy that the department is moving in that direction. Uh, one of the things, I guess last things that we, we could talk about here is that there's some stuff going on uh, that people could look forward to experiencing. Mm -hmm. I believe the Spring Showcase or mm -hmm. something like that. Can you talk to us about that? Sure, we have, um, we have several things coming up. We are going to be opening a lie of the mind soon. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're watching this on Friday, when we release it, we have Gentleman's Guide, our welcome back to the live stage happening. Uh, we will be doing the launch fundraiser where we basically do a showcase in a way of our senior performance majors before they go to New York. And then moving into the winter, we have our two shows that came out of the, uh, came out of our workshops. We have Polaroid Stories, which is a really beautifully poetic, I hate to use the word, but edgy look and melding of traditional Roman mythology and street children based partially on true stories and partially on mythology. And then we move into the musical at the end of the season. We have a lot coming up. And in the midst of there, in, in uh, March, March 23rd, 4 o'clock, we're going to be having our spring update. We will be coming back to you, and we're going to be sharing with you what we've done, where we're going. We're going to include things about what the department's doing as a whole, where we're going, and of course, where we're tracking in terms of our ideas and initiatives, and hopefully reporting back on some suggestions that you, I hope, will make to us in the feedback on this session. That's wonderful to hear. I really appreciate your time, uh, TJ, being very thoughtful and purposeful and making sure that the, the department is being as transparent as possible. And, and so transparency is very key in these in situations because you think about if things aren't communicated out, then we're left to our own narratives to think about, okay, this is what must be happening, nothing's happening at all. Uh, and though it's, it's great to see that the department is moving in the right direction and that you all have been very thoughtful in responding uh, to a lot of the concerns that our community members and alumni have had. And 
I'm sure you'll be the first to admit we're not where we need to be. No. Uh, but we have some direction. Yeah, we do. We have some guidance. And that's thanks to all of you out there that have really held us accountable as a university, as a department, to make sure that we are living to our creed. And so we hope that you continue this journey with us and our improvement for equity and inclusion in the department with a specific focus on racial diversity. Remember earlier we talked about how much we valued the input that our alums gave to us and that our students gave to us through the survey. We have another opportunity we want to hear from you. So if you're reading this on social media, down in the comments section there's going to be a link to a survey where you can express your thoughts about today, your suggestions. Uh, we pose a few questions where perhaps you can help us out a little bit, finding new places to take Otterbein and expose Otterbein. So please, we welcome, go to the link, give us your thoughts, give us your ideas. And on March 23rd at 4 p.m. when we do our spring update, we'll report back to you on the things you asked us and the things you suggested. Thank you once again for joining us very much. Good day.